Welcome to part two of the ICC Intermediate Course on Culture and this section is entitled The Pillars of Culture. When you're looking at any subject it's very useful to put it into different sections and to look at the sections bit by bit that helps us to understand the whole and I've split uh, a subject of culture into the four pillars of culture. Now in a sense you could dissect culture into many different segments however I found that this is an easy way to understand it. The way that you will look at these four pillars as we go through this particular presentation is to understand first of all that actually they always overlap so business is affected by the family, advertising is affected by what government says it can do, politics, religion are affected by uh, the culture itself feeding back into what's going on. So there are all sorts of ways of overlapping these things but I think if we look at it at the four pillars of cu culture it will help us to understand. And I basically call these four pillars as follows. First of all business economics that's the first pillar that holds the table of culture up secondly education and family thirdly media entertainment advertising newspapers poster boards um, even computers and social media all come into that section then finally politics government and religion and I know that we've talked about the fact that religion fits into government in a very special way. These are the four pillars that I say culture rests on. Culture is not static, it's always changing. It's constantly changeable though sometimes we're not aware of the fact that it's changing, usually because that change is slow and imperceptible. When change is fast, then we notice it more clearly. Culture is also becoming almost generic. That is to say, wherever we go in the world, we're recognising things that look very much the same. And like when you go to different airports, you can see all the same goods on sale that you saw at the airport you left from. Um, the world is being pressured into a generic world culture. That's not totally true of course and different countries still have their special cultural effects. We can sometimes refer to it as the global village effect. In terms of review as I've already said, if you go to your next door neighbours and they are very much the same as you, same family background, same um, nationality and so on, nevertheless you will change your culture. But because that's a micro change you probably won't think about it and you probably won't notice it very much. But in fact, just the way they make the tea or they don't drink tea or whatever, will actually have cultural effects and you have actually changed the culture. It helps us to see the pillars of culture in separation because then we can think through the implications of each section more effectively. Um, but of course, as I've already said, they overlap, they are in connect, interconnected but we want to try and see them in separate positions so that that will help us to understand the whole. Let's look first of all at the pillar of economics and business, pillar number one. We often don't think about that as part of moulding our culture but in reality it's a very powerful moulder. If you don't have a roof over your head or shelter and warmth, that will have a real effect on how you think and how you act and ultimately will affect the way your cultural expressions 
are expressed. The advertising industry spends millions trying to sell us things and that's done by persuading us about our image and our cultural expression. Uh, one friend of mine said that the great tragedy is that the advertising industry tries to take away from us our dignity and then it sells us back our dignity at the price of the product that they're advertising to us. Pillar number two, education and family. The two things are linked because it's important to understand that education is not simply going to school, college or university. It actually happens in all areas of life. In fact, Dr. Donald Howard, the founder of Accelerated Christian Education said, education is life. And of course it is. And that we receive our education in lots of ways, not simply through the pace, or through a presentation like this, but simply by being around people, by traveling, by listening, by talking, by reading, by watching television. All of those things are putting things into our life and our being. They're educating us. Sometimes we need to be very careful of what we are allowing um, into our minds um, because that education might all not always be correct or useful. I've often said to people that we need to understand that our mind uh, needs to be clean and not a rubbish bin. Um, the Bible talks about uh, our minds being uh, fixed on things that are good, healthy, wholesome and useful. And of course if we put bad things into our mind, what actually happens is that bad things come out of our lives. education is life many of you watching this presentation will be too young to remember the transition between what was formerly called the country of Rhodesia to now what has become the country of Zimbabwe I remember it very well because friends of mine on the borders of what was then called the frontline states was killed by one of the revolutionary soldiers coming across from the frontline states into what was then called Rhodesia. And they did something very interesting. These people actually particularly attacked schools and educational establishments. And what they would do tragically is they would kill all the staff, which is where my friends got killed. And they would take the children and students back across the border into what was called the frontline states and then they would say, we're going to educate you properly. In other words, in revolutionary thinking, you see why they did that? That's because education moulds culture. And they wanted them to understand a culture different to what they were being educated in. They wanted them to understand the revolution. And that was why they concentrated on the schools and the younger people. Interesting, isn't it? Pillar number three, media, entertainment, advertising. One day on a television program, people were asked, are you persuaded by advertising? And they had a group of people in an audience and they asked them to put their hands up um, by which, uh, telling the uh, presenter which particular petrol brand they bought for their cars. All of them were drivers. What was very interesting is at the end of the program, we noted that the petrol that was most advertised, most people in the audience said that they put that particular brand into their car. Advertising spend number two, actually coincided with the second amount of hands that went up and said we buy this particular brand and the same with section number three that the same amount of people in other words 
one, two, and three equaled exactly one, two, three in terms of advertising spend. When we say that we're not persuaded by advertising, we're actually not being very sensible. We're all of us influenced by what we see. The entertainment industry, of course, is very much part of the advertising industry. And I wonder how many of us are really aware of what is called product placement in films and television programs. Companies pay lots of money to the film producers and the broadcasters persuading them to put their particular crockery or their car or their curtains or their furnishings hopefully with a label that you can see that that's what is on the program that you're watching oftentimes this passes us and we don't really think much about it but let me tell you our brains have registered the fact that that product was in that show and of course from the advertising point of view they're hoping that will that will say well I would like to be like that I would like my house to look like that I would like my car to drive like that and you end up being a good purchaser advertising is very clever and it's persuading us it's influencing us it's molding the culture the advertising industry spends huge amounts of money on advertising in different ways posters TV adverts, newspaper adverts, product placement that we just talked about. Why do they do that? Do you think that they're stupid and they're wasting the money? I don't think so. I think they're about, they're about selling us things and they want us to buy their products. And of course, actually doing that and buying those products and being persuaded by the advertisers, we're actually altering step by step our culture and bringing it into line in what the advertisers think the culture ought to be really like. What do you think? Don't you think that in many ways the media, the advertising industry, the newspapers, the TV, they're all moulding the way we think and therefore they become strong moulders of our culture and in fact ultimately the culture of the global village. Finally, pillar number four, politics, government, religion. What happens in our legislature ultimately changes our lives. Now, oftentimes people don't really understand that, but in fact it does. So when a law changes, or the government changes a law, say you've got something that was legal, or say something that wasn't legal, and then the government steps in and says, well, now it is legal, that changes the law. Ultimately, that changes the way that people think about things and changes the way people act. And so suddenly something that wasn't uh, a legal way of being becomes legal and so it affects the culture and changes the culture. We often say politics are boring, yet politics enters every part of our life. It's moulding and changing us all the time. Not just the politics of central government, but the politics that is local, our local councils, our local church uh, government. It's all affecting the way that culture is and changing it all the time. Politics and religion. Some people question why we put these two things together. But from time immemorial, the state has used religion to influence and control society and thus influence our culture and our actions. Consider, for example, in the United Kingdom, the relationship of the Church of England and the state. We, in our legislature, the House of Lords, by right sit Church of England bishops, making the law and controlling the law and affecting the law. Consider historically the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine. Until that time, the Church had been almost an underground um, organisation away from politics and away from real influence but suddenly 
Constantine becomes a Christian, or at least he said he was, and Christianity becomes the Roman Empire's preference religion. And so suddenly the church begins to build buildings to meet in. Um, it uh, gives the rights of government, as in, in, in the United Kingdom, to appoint its leaders and eventually that is moulding the way that society works. Consider not just in the United Kingdom but around the world how much religion moulds the cult culture of different countries. Ask yourself that question, think about it. Who are we? That's a funny question to ask but in fact our culture is really an outward expression of who we are, both individually and collectively. But to answer the question who we are, it's actually a very complicated question. It's, a, it's complicated because our culture persuades us to think and act in a certain way. And we've already talked about the fact that culture is subject to change and is being changed by government, by business, by education all the time. But in fact, some of the ways we think are far older than many of us know. I wonder if you could answer the question, what really is the oldest way of making us think? A culture, as we've said, comes into being by the four pillars that hold it up and make it and shape it. I want us now to finish this particular presentation to look at a book. It's one that I've written, actually. It's called Jacob, A Fatherless Generation. And I want us to read the book and then write a 500 word essay on that book, or a book report, if you will, telling us exactly what you see is the oldest culture and the way that people think and some of the things that you find are perhaps contradictory to the way that our culture acts and behaves. It's a very good exercise. Let's do it. Okay, this is the end of part two, and I want us to write a book review on the book Jacob, A Fatherless Generation by Adrian Hawkes. The book can be obtained from ICCE at Swindon, and I want, us, I want you to tell in that book, report, what you think is the oldest culture affecting our world today. And then I'd like you to tell us some of say six of the major differences between two cultures mentioned there in the book.